The year is 1951, two years after Oldsmobile and Cadillac debuted their overhead valve V8 designs, and three years before Ford debuted theirs, Studebaker bakes an overhead valve V8. Studebaker did not have a V8 before 1951, going overhead valve because overhead valve was the new trend and was a good thing. The engine had a 14-year run, one block size, Five displacements, 232.6, 224, 259.2, aka 259, 289, and 304.5. Introduced in 1951, 232.6 cubic inch displacement developed in house by Studebaker engineers. Some will say that Studebaker copied the Cadillac V8 design because they look very similar on the outside. The intake manifolds will bolt up to both engines, but they will not work because intake ports are different. But on the inside of the engine, Studebaker took a more conservative approach. The Cadillac overhead valve V8 featured slipper pistons with scalloped skirts for crankshaft clearance, which allowed for a more compact cylinder block, whereas Studebaker went for a more traditional approach, fully skirted pistons, which meant the deck height was taller. Studebaker design included timing gears to drive the camshaft, whereas Cadillac design used sprockets in a silent chain. Studebaker made no provision in their design to go hydraulic valves later in life. So just keep that in mind that all of these engines have solid valve lifters. 232.6 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8, 3.8 liters. It was good for anywhere between 120 to 127 horsepower at 4,000 RPM, 190 pound-feet of torque at 2,000 RPM with a bore of 3.4 inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches. Compression could be anywhere from 6.5 to 1 or 7 to 1. The block and head were both made of cast iron. This engine weighed about 650 pounds with a forged crankshaft, solid lifters, five main bearings. The years that this engine was produced was from 1951 to 1954. This engine could be found in the Commander as well as Studebaker trucks. In 1955, Studebaker would offer two new displacements, starting for the first half of the year, which is the rarest of all Studebaker V8s, 224 cubic inch displacement. It went by economy overhead valve V8 and was only on offer for the first half of 1955. It was the base engine in the Commander series. Some would say that this was the smoothest of all of the Studebaker V8s. Studebaker was tossing around the idea of getting rid of their Flathead 6 design. They wanted to make a 200 cubic inch displacement V8 that would fill that void. 224.3 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8. 3.8 liters. This engine was good for 140 horsepower at 4,500 RPM, 202 pound-feet of torque at 2,800 RPM with a bore of 3.6 inches and a stroke of 2.8 inches. Compression 7.5 to 1 featured 5 main bearings. It was only available for half of the year, making its debut halfway through 1955 model year, the 259 V8. Featured different heads than the 224 V8 with slightly bigger intake and exhaust ports. These heads would remain this way for the rest of the production cycle. 259.2 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8, 4.2 liters. It's good for anywhere between 162 horsepower all the way up to 195 horsepower at 4,500 RPM. 250 to 260 pound-feet of torque at 3,000 RPM with a bore of 3.6 inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches. Compression could be anywhere between 7.5 to 1 to 8.5 to 1. Featured five main bearings. This engine was offered in two barrel and four barrel carburetor options. Years this engine was used was 1955 to 1964. In 1956, Studebaker stroked the 259 to 289 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8 4.7 liters. It's good for anywhere between 195 horsepower all the way up to the 290 
horsepower figure, which could be found in the R1 and R2 engines at 4,500 RPM, 286 pound-feet of torque, all the way up to 305 pound-feet of torque at 3,000 RPM, with a bore of 3.6 inches and a stroke of 3.6 inches. Compression could be anywhere between 8.5 to 1, all the way up to 1025 to 1. Five main bearings built of cast iron. In 1957, Studebaker offered a Paxton supercharger on the 289 for more power, which took the stock horsepower from 195 up to 270 horsepower, almost a 100 horsepower increase. Studebaker offered the 289 from 1956 all the way out to 1964, and it could be found in the Golden Hawk, the Silver Hawk, Power Hawk. GT Hawk, Avanti, just about anything. Daytona. In 1963 through 1964, Studebaker offered R series engines, one through five. Not to get confused with the 2R and the 3R series trucks, which Studebaker offered from 1949 to 1953. They don't have anything to do with that. The R engines were like race engines. Let's start with the one in the basement. Of the R series, 289 cubic inch displacement overhead valve, R1, 4.7 liters. It's good for 240 horsepower, 4,500 RPM, 305 pound feet of torque at 3,000 RPM. With a bore of 3.6 inches and a stroke of 3.6 inches, compression was 1025 to 1. The R2 was what the R1 was, but it didn't have as high of compression and it had a supercharger, which boosted power up to 290 horsepower at 5,200 RPM. Compression was a bit lower, around 9 to 1. In 1964, Studebaker offered the legendary engine. Super underrated, lots of conflicting information, almost like Studebaker's swan song. It's important to note that these engines weren't production engines. These engines were like a secret menu engine option. Studebaker bored the 289 to 304.5 cubic inch displacement. It's worth mentioning that all of the internals were different than the 289 and had to be made custom, custom pistons, custom connecting rods, because the stock rods couldn't take the high stress and high engine speeds. 304.5 cubic inch displacement R3 supercharged V8 5 liters. It's good for anywhere between 335 horsepower. Some sources say this engine could make up to 400 horsepower at 5350 RPM. 320 pound feet of torque at 4000 RPM. With a bore of 3.65 inches and a stroke of 3.6 inches. If that's wrong, please correct me in the comment section below. There's tons of conflicting information about the R3, R4, and R5. Compression, 9.5 to 1. This engine had two options as far as camshaft profile went. You could get 276 degree or 288 was optional. There's said to be 140 of these engines made. The R3... Avani was taken to the Bonneville Salt Flats where it shattered 29 records. The R4 was even rarer with only eight or less were made. It was a naturally aspirated 304.5 cubic inch displacement with high compression, 12 to one. This engine featured dual quads. It was rated at 280 horsepower, which is Eh, power output for a 305 cubic inch anything. Breaking from the script for a little bit, in my opinion, the R4 should have been the R3 because you always want the biggest and baddest last. It wasn't as good as the R3, and why, did, why was it R4? The R5 was the biggest and baddest engine, but they only made one. 304.5 cubic inch displacement with twin superchargers and fuel injection. It was put into an Avanti and it was said to make over 500 horsepower. That was the R5. Studebaker wasn't doing so hot in 1963. The R series was sort of a last ditch effort in a way to try to turn things around. The South Bend plant closed in 63. 
Sales wasn't good, so Sherwood Egbert was ousted. Studebaker would continue to produce cars and trucks until 1966. Vehicles would be produced in Canada until Studebaker exited the auto market. Studebaker did not go bankrupt. They just stopped making cars. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather, two scenarios today. In the first scenario, would you rather have a 1951 Studebaker Commander or a 1957 Golden Hawk or 1955 Studebaker Speedster? I'm going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free. Pause the video. Moving on to the second scenario. 1964 Lark Daytona with an R3 or 1963 Avanti with an R3 or 1963 Hawk GT with an R3. I don't know if they put any R3s in the Hawk or the Daytona, but just imagine if they did. Which one would you choose? Going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free to pause the video. Now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to get both the name of the band and the song title correctly in the comment section will have your comment pinned to the top of it. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group I call The After Party. It gives you the opportunity to share your rides, stories, experiences, pictures, movies. You can share anything automotive on there. Feel free to check it out. The link will be in the description below. If you don't have Facebook and you would still like to reach me, send me a telegram. I mean, carrier pigeon. I mean, email at what it's like at yahoo.com all of it will be linked in the description below just know i appreciate everything from you guys i really really do i love the stories i even love the criticisms and the critiques i really like that i dig it thank you all so much for being part of this wonderful car community and until next time toodaloo ah 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 ah